Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode four of the Cloud Accounting Podcast, the audio edition of Cloud Accounting Weekly, a free email update for accountants and controllers using cloud technology to improve efficiencies and make their jobs more strategic and impactful. For this podcast, my guest and I have selected five of our favorite cloud accounting related articles we've read over the past few weeks. We'll take turns sharing the article's key points and then discuss. And for those of you listening in live, we're interested to hear your thoughts as well. So please feel free to share those with us using the comments or questions feature in the webinar. If you're interested in staying up to date on the latest in cloud accounting, I highly encourage you to subscribe to Cloud Accounting Weekly at cloudaccountingweekly.com. Topics include accounting technology, automation, remote work, managing a modern accounting team, and more. Pretty much anything I find interesting as an accountant obsessed with technology to get rid of the crap that's historically been part of the job. We are recording live on CPA Academy, your source for free CPE. Visit CPA Academy at cpaacademy.org. And thanks to everyone who has uh, tuned in live today. This podcast is brought to you by Flowcast, closed management software built by accountants for accountants to help them close faster and more accurately. For more additional resources for controllers and accounting managers, visit flowcast.com and click the resources tab. That's F-L-O-Q-A-S-T dot com. I am your host, Blake Oliver, also the author of Cloud Accounting Weekly. You can connect with me on Twitter at Blake T. Oliver or via my personal website, blakeoliver.com. My guest today is Mike Whitmire, co-founder and CEO of Flowcast. Mike isn't the biggest fan of social media, but <laughs> he is on LinkedIn, so be sure to follow him there. And um, Mike, thanks for joining me today. Appreciate uh, you guys having me on. I'm excited. So before we get started, um, what is one non-accounting thing people might be interested to know about you? Well, this this beard is somewhat recent. I, it's certainly after the public accounting days, and post baby is when I decided to stop shaving. Well, it's kind of, uh, I guess, to major in accounting. So I'm from Los Angeles originally. Actually, moved to the East Coast and went to Syracuse and upstate New York to uh, get my accounting degree and then got sick of the cold and moved back to uh, Los Angeles to start my career. And, you know, I'm in L.A., so I got to audit media and entertainment companies for the most part. That was my focus. Big Dodger fan. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get right to it. So as I said before, uh, the point of this podcast is we talk about our top five cloud accounting stories from the past week. And, and I'll start with number one. This is a story out of the Harvard Business Review entitled, If You're So Successful, Why Are You Still Working 70 Hours a Week? And as somebody who worked as a manager in a public accounting firm, a top 25 firm, um, I, I, this hit home for me in that um, the author claims that she has done research to prove uh, that people who are attracted to uh, elite professional services firms are, quote, um, insecure overachievers, unquote. Mm -hmm. And um, what she says about them is that they are exceptionally capable and fiercely ambitious, and are but are driven by a profound sense of their own inadequacy that typically stems from childhood. And they work long hours to prove their value to the organization due to difficulty of measuring the output of knowledge workers. When it's hard to measure the output, you just want to be the last person to leave the office if you really want to show that you're the best. And even more, she, she actually interviewed this, this, the author, Laura Empson, interviewed uh, uh, hiring managers at professional services firms who acknowledged that they actually deliberately target this type of person. So, Mike, Mike I really wanted to get your take on this, being a former big four yeah, yeah. accountant. Since I was, you know, in a, I would say, mid-sized firm, what do you, what do you think? Is this, is this real or is this crap? I never thought about it this way until it came up in the article and it was a little bit disturbing because I thought back, I was like, wow, that actually really applies to how I thought about my job at Ernst & Young. You know, you're kind of, in a sense, just judged on the time you leave at the end of the day. People certainly don't remember what time you got into the office. Your, the quality of your work papers isn't necessarily the determining factor of if your team thinks you're good at your job or if you really care about being part of the team. It's what time you leave at night that determines all of that. And I also think, just kind of in thinking back about the type of people that end up in a professional services role, generally you grow up with very hands-on parents who yep. expect results from you. You gotta get A's in you gotta school. Get, you gotta get A's, you need to get great uh, SAT scores or ACT scores, whatever the, whatever the kids take nowadays. Um, and you just have very much higher expectations on you and you're always judged based on your output. 
yep. right? So did you get the GPA? Did you win on a roll? All that kind of stuff. And so when you get in the professional world, that's not going to change. It's just you're no longer trying to appease your parents. You're trying to appease everyone else around you and impress them. Well, and that's interesting what you said about grades, because in school, it's actually very easy yeah. to measure your output. It's just whatever your GPA is. Mm -hmm. But I felt like when I entered the, the professional world, suddenly that, that's not quite the same, right? Yeah. I mean, what I was graded on at my firm was my billable hours, mm. right? Yep. So like if I want to be in the top 10% or I want to be leading my, my group, I have to just put in as many hours as I can. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was weird for me. You know? it was, our, ours was kind of a mix. So we did performance reviews every year and it was a pretty intense process. And, <clears throat> but it was very simple. It boiled down to you got a one to a five and that determined your race for the year. And I came to the conclusion that it's a popularity contest at the end of the day. And a lot of, go, a lot of work goes into being the most popular person on your audit team. It's not necessarily, are you the best auditor in the world? So that's even worse, right? right? Putting in all these hours, but it doesn't even really end up mattering. Exactly. <laughs> totally. So like, you know, I got high scores and I was not the best auditor in the world. I don't think I deserve those high scores based on my pure work output. But my team liked me. My clients really liked me. You know, customer service was one of Customer service was my favorite part of being an auditor, helping them and trying to make their life, getting through the audit as easy as possible was what I really enjoyed. And so I always got high marks from the client, which fed into my ultimate performance review, which determined my raise, which was a little bit crazy to me. It wasn't necessarily my manager being like, oh, you know, there are all these review notes that need to be cleared or anything like that. It was just, do people like them? Does it work hard? Mm -hmm. And there you go. Well, and so the question might be, uh, how does this all tie into cloud technology or accounting? And and the way I'm thinking about it is, is, I mean, one big problem in accounting is that we haven't had a way to measure, uh, measure people's outputs, mm -hmm. right? There has, so so what it, I'm excited to be at Flowcast because we have actual analytics yeah. in the application. So you can see how many reconciliations somebody has done, how many tasks they've done, and you can, act, you can see if somebody's doing double the workload of somebody else, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. so I think that's really cool. All right, Mike, it's your turn. <laughs> Story number awesome. two. Well, tax incentives. So I'm a, I'm a tax guy. I love talking about this stuff. And with with all the recent tax legislation changes that have been going underway, there's a lot of interesting things coming about. This one to me was really fascinating. Um, tax incentives putting more robots on factory floors. And what I find is it's it's very uh, contrary to kind of what we're hearing from from the White House and what the goals are. Right. So the goals of our government right now is to, to create more jobs. That's what we hear about. Right. Like creating more yep. jobs, bringing jobs back to America. But unfortunately, if you're incentivizing on purchasing equipment under the idea it's going to create more jobs, you're just not fully grasping the reality of equipment and how it works now. Equipment is not necessarily built to create jobs anymore. Equipment's built to take away jobs and to automate that work. So I think it's actually going to have a completely incorrect impact on what mm -hmm. we want to do for the economy. And so this is going to just you know automate the jobs that are they pay well, they're pretty consistent, they're stable, and it's going to just put more people out of business, yeah. unfortunately. And I don't know how much that's really contemplated, <clears throat> but the putting tax incentives like this in place, you know, you used to have to uh, depreciate over a period of time. Now you get to take all the deductions up front is going to be significant. Um, and there's even a quote in there, a gentleman by the name of Ken Mathis talks about how he's going to put $1.5 million into this and it's going to be in robots, not in workers to, to make up for the mm -hmm. uh, kind of lack of inefficiency. Yeah. And, and sort of to play devil's advocate, this has been uh, the trend toward automation has been happening anyway. Yeah. Right. So uh, is, is tax reform really responsible for it or is it just putting you know, extra gas on the fire. Yeah, ta tax reform is a, a means for nudging people in a certain direction, yeah. right? So it's very rarely the complete catalyst for something, but it can encourage certain behavior and maybe not always encourage the intended behavior necessarily, um, but I feel like this is a situation where they're influencing what's going on. Now, as, as software developers, I, I suppose it would be nice if companies could fully write off uh, all the cost of, of, of what we do, but unfortunately, this is only for... Yeah. Capital investments. Right? Yeah, if we could, I mean, you know, we have we technically capitalize our software. If we could expense all that immediately, it would be of great benefit to our our uh, financials. Yeah. All right, coming in at number three, Sage's plans for Sage Intact and growth. So this uh, story is about Sage. Um, not a lot of people in the U.S. are are that familiar with Sage unless they happen to use one of their ERP products. A lot of their products are desktop based or have been um, until recently. So. In January, Stephen Kelly, the CEO of Sage, um, introduced his strategic plan for the next few years. And 
he was sort of a, had to address some disappointing uh, Q4 results. He said that you know, they're going to do one of the typical things, which is cut their GNA costs from 20% to 10%. That's an easy way to, to increase the bottom line. But he also put a big emphasis on cloud. He said that cloud is at the tipping point um, versus on-premises software in the U.S. And I believe he's speaking specifically or mostly about ERPs, right? Um, and he had some stats, too. The U.S. apparently is at 49%, um, which I, I, I'm surprised that it's getting that it's, it's going that fast. Yeah. Um, uh, UK, 34%, France, 26%, and Spain is only at 12%. Um, and those international figures are important because Sage is an inter international company. So their plan is um, with the acquisition of Intact, Sage bought Intact, uh, was it last year? I think it was, it was last up, year, right? Up on a year now. For, yeah. was it close to a billion dollars, right? 850 million. 800. I remember that number, yep. So Sage bought Intact, which is a, a cloud-based ERP solution based uh, here in the U.S., really exclusive to U.S. customers at this point. And so their plan is to internationalize Sage Intact and use that as one of their top cloud um, solutions yeah. going forward. So that's really exciting for, for, you know, for us. Yeah. I mean, for starters, Intact's a great company, you know, as a group of people, they're just great. So it's a, <clears throat> certainly an excellent acquisition by Sage. I think it makes a ton of sense for Sage, right? They're, they're very dominant in Europe. That's, that's where most of their business is and it's mostly on premise. And so this gives them an opportunity to not only expand into the U.S., but also expand into the cloud by buying a great product immediately. So this makes a ton of sense for me. And Intact, you know, we work with them, we integrate through their API, a great partner. And I think that if you're gonna kind of pluck any cloud ERP out there to wanna to work with, that's the right one to, to make a move with. And I was actually quite surprised. I thought my prediction for the last couple of years has been that Microsoft was gonna buy them. Mm, that to me made a lot of sense to kind of plug that in. Uh, but I think Sage was the highest, uh, the highest bidder at that, at that point. Well, they certainly did pretty well. Yeah, themselves. <laughs> they, did, they did well. I, I was a little surprised they, they forewent an IPO, though. They were they were certainly an IPO level company marching that direction, and I, I was a little taken aback by the sale. We've got a question from a Chris. Chris says, "Are robots? Let's see. I think you you mean to ask, are robots self maintaining?" And this this goes back to our previous uh, yeah. uh, article, and thankfully. No, they are not yet. <laughs> yep, <laughs> not, not yet. That's the job opportunity, being the administrator of the automation software or the one who maintains the equipment that's automated. Yep. I think once the robots can maintain themselves, we're in some trouble. That's the downward yeah. spiral. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and especially once they can build more robots, then we'll be then then that'll be an interesting world. All right, number four, Mike. This is one of yours. Yeah. Uh, article in Accounting Web by Trent McLaren. Yeah, I mean it's. You know, Slack, a, a great piece of software, super easy to use. And I think Slack becoming very popular with accountants, right, is it makes a lot of sense just overall with the technology shift. So accountants, to me, it seems like we have all these different pain points. And rather than purchasing one bulky ERP, let's go out and find maybe best in breed solutions for each of those areas. This fits the bill for me. It plugs into that happening further. It's an excellent communication tool. We use it internally email killer, right? So you get to have these communications where the whole company understands what's going on or your channel understands what's going on. And then by opening up their API, I mean, it's incredibly flexible and you can do all kinds of stuff, whether you're integrating with third party applications or you can even, it's fairly simple to integrate it with maybe in-house software mm -hmm. that you've built as yep. well. So super flexible. I can understand why it's becoming so popular in the accounting world. And I don't, I don't see that slowing down you know, at all. So for those of you who want to read this article, I recommend it. Uh, it's called A Scary New Era of Slack Accountants on accountingweb.co.uk. Uh, one of the additional points that I really like in the article is Trent talks about using Zapier mm -hmm. to integrate applications with Slack. And Zapier, um, if, you haven't, if you're not familiar with it, it's sort of like a, an API enabler, right? Mm -hmm. So instead of a company having to build an integration with every other product that's out there, maybe hundreds, they can simply integrate with Zapier and then Zapier facilitates the integration with all the other apps. So it's, it's like a cloud pipes type solution, really, really powerful. An example of, of Zapier, the way I use it is to stay on top of social media. Uh, I can connect Twitter and Facebook to a channel in Slack. Yeah. And, and you can even do cool things like track uh, all of the tweets about a specific event using the hashtag and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So like during Sage Intact or doing Sweet World, that's a cool way to stay for the team to stay on top of uh, what's happening yeah. back home. 
I don't, I don't want to sell for them too much, but their software is great. And actually back in the day, I'm an accountant. I was able to write an integration with them. When we started, we were using Xero. Um, mm-hmm. you're, you're a big fan of Xero. We were using that initially and we had, then we're using the small little CRM and they actually had a connector available. So I, as an accountant, was able to set up an integration where when we close an opportunity in our CRM, it pushed over and created an invoice out of zero. That's awesome. Which was pretty sweet. Yeah, and the, fact, pretty the fact that I don't know anything about programming and was able to drag and drop some stuff and make yep. it work was pretty appealing to me. Plus, great, great group of guys running that company as well. That's a perfect example yeah. of uh, the of cloud accounting, yep. right? Creating automation through off-the-shelf apps. Mm-hmm. Number five, <laughs> our, our favorite, our final story of the episode. Why Excel is not the enemy of accountants. So, Mike, this is a, a blog post that you wrote on Flowcast.com. Maybe, maybe I'd love for you to give us a little background on why, why, why do we even have to debate whether or not Excel is good for accountants? That's like, well, <laughs> why is this a question? The starting point. Well, I mean, we have a lot of uh, enterprise software companies trying to replace Excel, which is a really interesting vision. And to me, it feels like tech just for the sake of tech for a lot of these companies. And then in particular, I think we wanted to write this article because we've just noticed that the marketing around this is really ramping up over the last six months or a mm-hmm. year. I feel like there's a lot of kind of negative stuff coming out about, out about Excel. <clears throat> we as accountants love it. We understand how to use it. So we don't have a ton of issues with it. So just wanted to offer a bit of a rebuttal in our stance on, you know, why we love Excel and why we think it's great. Yep. But also, also, you know, discuss the weaknesses that it does have. Be open about that and figure out, is there a better way to mitigate those weaknesses than just taking the entire piece of software away from you, right? And I would argue it's much better to have the flexibility of Excel and take care of some of those issues rather than just not be able to use it anymore. And, and for those of you who uh, didn't see some of these articles, um, this was late last year in the Wall Street Journal. Mm-hmm. There was a, a series of articles um, that sort of prompted, I, it's hard to know if, if, they, if, if one of these competitors uh, made this article happen because it seemed pretty self-serving. They did. <laughs> um, but uh, it was an article in the Wall Street Journal about how um, something to the effect of you know, finance chiefs are telling their staff to stop using Excel and promoting the benefits of all-in-one solutions, right? Uh, and this just caused an uproar, right? Mm-hmm. And, and so uh, this, this CPA, Stephen Yacht, um, he became, he had his 15 minutes of fame because he tweeted, you can have my Excel after you ripped it from my cold, dead hands. <laughs> and of course, then that became an article. And, you know, I, I find this fascinating because I feel like this, this is a really a central debate around how should software be structured these days, right? Should, should software be um, multiple applications that you yeah. put together and layer on top of each other and create a tech stack? Or should you go with that all-in-one solution? Yeah, you're, I think you're spot on. At the end of the day, it boils down to that, that debate. We at Flowcast firmly believe best in breed solutions are the way to go. You know, you'd rather you'd rather work with a company, a piece of software that that where that's the only thing they do. You know, at Flowcast, yeah. we focus on the month and close process and reconciliations. We are not going into other areas of you know finance and accounting. So we're not spending our product resources on things that are like half big pieces of functionality. You know, we're very focused on our core product and making that better every single day. And by having that focus and knowledge in house, that's how we're able to offer a significantly better product than maybe the larger competitors who have dedicated one small module right. to dealing with this, right? Like Oracle has something that does a little bit of this, but it's just not on the level of what we do because right. we live and breathe this stuff. That's all we do. But you don't have to hire like two dozen developers to try and recreate Excel. Yeah, right? totally. <laughs> Which is pretty darn perfect after 20 years. Yeah, no, they, yeah. Microsoft's done an excellent job. All right. Well, that is it for us for this week. I want to thank everyone for listening in. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to po- paste the uh, article titles and links into the chat now so that you can read these if you like. And if you're listening on the podcast, um, I'll put this in the show notes. That is it from us. So please tune in next month. You can uh, register again at cpaacademy.org and subscribe to Cloud Accounting Weekly, cloudaccountingweekly.com. Please visit, uh, if you're interested in closed management software and what it can do, visit flowcast.com. And you can always check out my personal blog at blakeoliver.com. Thanks a lot, everyone. Have a great week. Yeah, thank you. Have a great week.